I'm so excited about our speaker today and want to thank all of you again. So many positive comments, retweets, and uh, support yesterday for this concept of connecting with each other, thinking about kinship both with and for each other, but most importantly, with the students that we work with and connecting to them. I admire Father Boyle's work a great deal and want to personally thank Father Boyle for being here today. Thank you very much. Benchmark is proud to be supporting this session. Gregory Boyle is the founder of Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, California, the largest gang intervention, rehabilitation, and reentry program in the world. A Jesuit priest from 1986 to 1992, Father Boyle served as pastor of Dolores Mission Church, then the poorest Catholic parish in Los Angeles that also had the highest concentration of gang activity in the city. Father Boyle witnessed the devastating impact of gang violence on his community during the so-called decade of death that began in Los Angeles in the late 1980s and peaked at 1,000 gang-related killings in 1992. In the face of law enforcement tactics and criminal justice policies of suppression and mass incarceration as the means to end gang violence, Father Boyle and parish and community members adopted what was a radical approach at the time, treat gang members as human beings. In 1988, they started what would eventually become Homeboy Industries, which employs and trains former gang members in a range of social enterprises as well as provides critical services to thousands of men and women who walk through its doors every year seeking a better life. Please help me in welcoming Father Greg Boyle for his presentation, Lessons from the Field Kinship as an Intervention. Thank you for the musical introduction. Um, it, it's a privilege to be here. I, I'm an expert on nothing. For 35 years, I've worked with gang members, so apparently Kevin thought that made me eminently suited to speak to school superintendents, so uh, <laughs> you can take that up with him. Uh, we have a Jesuit connection, you know, and uh, Canisius and some people from McQuaid and uh, the homies at, at Homeboy Industries don't really, you know, get so much the Jesuit thing, you know, they they know I'm a priest, but they don't really know what the Jesuits are. And and uh, we have tours like every day, like six of them from folks from all over the world. And my office is this glass enclosed place. And, and I was sitting there talking to some homies in my office and I see a big tour group stop in front of my office with a tour leader named Gilbert. And it's one of those observe our founders, our founder in his natural habitat. And, <laughs> And, uh, and Gilbert has a loud ass voice, so he says, this is our founder, Father Greg Boyle. He is a jujitsu priest. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave it my best uh, shot. Anyway, it's the privilege of my life uh, for lo, these many years uh, to have walked with gang members. And the day won't ever come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I am closer to God than the thousands and thousands of men and women I've been privileged to know, people like Luis Perez, who uh, worked for us for like 10 years. He was a, a force of nature, gang member, shot caller from his gang, heroin addict, in recovery, was in prison for a stretch. Uh, and he liked giving talks, you know, and he was quite good at it. In fact, he was sort of in demand. Schools would ask for him by name. and. He and I, we went out to dinner one night, just the two of us, and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly. And uh, he said, you know, you gotta pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, yeah, no shit. That's, uh, <laughs> that is some good advice there. So that's just my way of saying, brace yourselves. Uh, anyway, I, here's what I think brings you to this fall summit. It's a, it's a longing that, in fact, the world might look differently than it currently looks. You know, you're about somehow imagining something different. You want to imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle. Mother Teresa, I think, was quite right when she diagnosed the world's ills and she said that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. 
So I think part of what you do as you gather is you stand against forgetting that. And uh, to that end, you want to create something magical, namely a community of kinship such that God might recognize it. You want to somehow create this thing that uh, invites people to think large. You, in your districts and in your schools, you want to kind of create the front porch of a house everybody wants to live in, a place of connection and exquisite mutuality. I think in order to do that, we all in our way have to find our way out to the margins because uh, if it's about imagining a circle and nobody's standing outside of it, it's also about the erasure of margins. Margins can't exist if we're standing out at them. Look under your feet. If we locate ourselves out with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless, we locate ourselves with those whose dignity has been denied and those whose burdens are more than they can bear. If we situate ourselves out with the easily despised and the readily left out, if we find that unique privilege to be able to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop, and with the disposable, so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. I suspect if kinship happened to be our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice. We'd be celebrating it. But we brace ourselves because we inch out to the margins and indeed people will accuse you of wasting your time. But the prophet Jeremiah wrote, for in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. You want to make those voices heard. You want to obliterate the illusion that there is an us and a them, that we are separate. So the homies have taught me everything of value uh, in the last 35 years of my life, and, and I'm e eternally grateful to them. But in the last few years, they've taught me how to text, and I'm really grateful because I find it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. And, and I'm pretty dexterous at it, you know, LOL and OMG and BTW, and the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. <clears throat> and I've been using that one quite a bit lately. <laughs> I know I can't be alone in being vexed by this autocorrect thing. You know, uh, I had a homegirl, Berta, a tough cookie, who texted me on, on a Sunday. She said, where are you at? And I, and I texted her back, I'm about to speak to a room full of monjas. And monjas is uh, nuns, sisters in Spanish for nuns. I'm about to speak to a room full of monjas. And I pushed send and autocorrect told her I was about to speak to a room full of ninjas. <laughs> which she thought was pretty darn interesting. And the homies even this morning, oh my God, you know, imagine the time difference here. But their, you know, their hair is always on fire and my light bill and oh my God, they're going to shut off this. And, I'm, and, and, and they're always in need of money. And a homie wrote me and said he, he just needed $100 to finish off his rent. And... I just didn't have it. So I wrote back simply, things are tight. And I pushed send and autocorrect told him, thongs are tight. <laughs> and he wrote me back, sorry to hear that. <laughs> uh, wh wh what about my rant? So, um, <laughs> So there I am in a car with two older vatos, Manuel and Poncho. They're going to help me give a talk at a high school in Palm Desert. So that's like two hours from LA. And we have our morning meeting. We have about hundreds and hundreds of our workers, all gang members, in the reception area. And we have a prayer and a thought for the day and stuff. And when that was over, we got in the car. And Manuel was in the front seat. And we're only 15 minutes on the road when he gets an incoming text. And he uh, reads it. And he chuckles. And I said, what is it? He goes, oh, it's dumb, it's from Snoopy, back at the office. 
Well, I'd just seen Snoopy. He was at the morning meeting. He gave me a big abrazo. And uh, Snoopy and Manuel work together in the clock-in room where they clock in hundreds and hundreds of our workers, all gang members, you know. And it's not a job I wouldn't want, actually, because this may come as a surprise. But gang members sometimes, you know, can be attitudinal. And so, um, so I say, well, what's he saying? He goes, oh, it's dumb. Hang on. Let me find it. Uh, here it is. Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. You have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, I nearly drove into oncoming traffic. We laughed so damn hard. And then, and then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other because I remember. And now they shoot text messages. And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How then do we obliterate the illusion that we are separate? We all share a kind of simple thing. We all have Buddha nature, as the Dalai Lama would say. We all have unshakable goodness. The homies at Homeboy Industries are used to being watched. They're not used to being seen. And this may well be true of all your students. Everybody wants to be seen. The Buddhists uh, begin a, a great many of their texts by saying, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. And so how do we see people? There's a, a Christmas carol, O Holy Night, and in it has, has this one line, long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. And yeah, it's about Christmas, and yeah, it's about Jesus. But how is it not the job description of everyone in this room? It's you appear and the soul feels its worth. Exactly right. You know, this past year, I, I buried my 92-year-old mama who had eight kids. I buried my father. 25 years ago, and she died as anyone would want to, in her own bed, in her own house, surrounded by the people she loves. And uh, she was sharp as a tack, even to the very end. In fact, in the last year of her life, she watched so much MSNBC, she was becoming Rachel Maddow. And, uh, <laughs> and she wasn't a lick afraid of death. Uh, it was kind of remarkable. Two weeks before she died, uh, she said to me, she was just positively giddy, you know, she goes, I've never done this before. <laughs> and it was like something you might say before skydiving, you know, and uh, in fact, her last words to me were the day before she died. I, I just happened to be there by myself, which never happened. And she was asleep and she woke up and she saw me. And she said, oh, for crying out loud. And she went back to sleep. Well, she was pissed off that she was still alive, you know, and I... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but the next day, again, just this never happened. At exactly noon, I was the only one there. My sisters, I have five of them, they were out trying to get lunch, and, and I was sitting there alone. And at, right at noon, she opened her eyes, and she let out this wondrous, tiny, glorious gasp. <gasps> Skydiving. And no one in earshot of this sound could ever be afraid of death again. But I mention all that because in the last weeks of her life, she'd be in and out of consciousness, and we'd be standing around her bed, three, eight, six of us. And uh, she would come to, and she'd lock on to one of us, and she'd look at you with this focus. And she would delight in you, and she would say breathlessly, you're here, you're here. And I think it's our job description is to see our kids and have our whole being say with breathless delight, you're here, you're here. 
Behold the one beholding you and smiling. Oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. Which means this has to be mutual. There can't be a distance, service provider, service recipient. Service is a good place to begin, but it's the hallway that leads you to the ballroom, and the ballroom is the place of connection and exquisite mutuality. You don't want there to be daylight between us. One of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend, and he was absolutely the best listener I've ever been in the presence of. If you were talking to him, nobody else existed. He was laser beam focused. He was never looking over your shoulder to see if maybe there was somebody more important on the approach. His whole being said, you're here, you're here. He saw you. But famously, a reporter had commented to him once, uh, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual. And of course it is. How do we arrive at this exquisite mutuality where there is no daylight that separates us, even as service providers and service recipients? There was a homie um, who I met after a talk I gave in Houston, and a former gang member had been to prison, and now he's what we call in the biz, a hardcore gang interventionist, and he's in the streets working with gang members. And he comes up to me and he pleads earnestly and he says, how do you reach them? Meaning gang members. And I found myself saying, well, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? And suddenly we turn something on its head. You don't go to the margins to make a difference. You go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make you different. And if you turn that on its head, you will never burn out and you will never feel depleted because you're going to the margins to breathlessly delight in the folks who are there. You go where love has not yet arrived and you love what you find. For there's an idea that's taken root in the world. It's at the root of all that's wrong with it. And the idea would be this that there just might be lives out there that matter less than other lives. And good for you, you stand against that idea. But we bridge the distance and we enter into the joy there is in exquisite mutuality at the margins. No homie found more job opportunities in our entire history than this kid we all called Dreamer. Uh, I knew him growing up in the housing projects where my parish was, and his older brothers were from a gang. He got into a gang, an exceedingly intelligent kid, though I don't think he ever really actually went to school very much, but he had a dangerous sense of humor, which I always enjoyed. He's in his 40s now, and a good job, a construction job, married kids, house. But in his early 20s, he was kind of a yo-yo, in and out of being locked up, and He'd uh, come to me and I'd find him a job in the private sector or in one of our nine social enterprises. And, and then he'd always gravitate back to vague criminality, usually something involving drugs, the sale of or the use of. And then he'd wander back to me. So it was a very repetitious pattern. And so this one time he finished a four month stretch a probation violation at county jail, and there he is sitting in front of my desk, and, and he says what gang members often say, this time it'll be different. And I went, hmm, all right. So with him sitting there, I picked up the phone, I called a friend of mine named Gary, who ran a vending machine company in Alhambra, California, and he had hired homies in the past, so I'm hoping against hope, maybe he'll do it again. Sure enough, that guy says, you tell that guy to show up tomorrow. That's a holy man right there. So Dreamer began work the next day at the vending machine company. Well, two weeks later, there he is again, sitting in front of my desk. I couldn't believe my eyeballs. I said, híjole madre santa, here we go all over again. 
But this time he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out his very first paycheck and he waves it proudly and he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. I mean, my mom, she's proud of me and my kids, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, well, <laughs> who? And he looked at me strangely and he said, well, God, of course. Oh, sure, no, that's right. <laughs> that, that would be God. You thought I was going to say you. I said, no, gosh, God's number one. <laughs> he said, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. And I'm sorry, them Genesis days? And he goes, yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already by now. <laughs> well, the two of us, literally, we just fell out of our chairs. We were howling with laughter. And I defy you to identify exactly who's the service provider, who's the service recipient. It's mutual. So Homeboy, it was started a long time ago, 1988, when I had hair. And, uh, I was the pastor of the poorest parish in the city, Dolores Mission, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. At the time, they comprised the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. We had eight gangs at war with each other, which led the LAPD to call my parish the place of the highest concentration of gang activity in the whole city. LA County has 1,100 gangs, 120,000 members, if LA was or is the gang capital of the world, my parish was the gang cap capital of Los Angeles. So I buried my first young person killed because of the sadness in 1988, and I buried my 226th two months ago. Not all from that community, but I run a very large gang intervention program, so I get asked to do this. And so the first thing we did was we started a school because there were so many uh, junior high, middle school age gang members who had been given the boot from their home school. Nobody wanted them. So uh, they were wreaking havoc in the middle of the day, you know, writing on the walls, selling drugs, violent. So I walked out to them and I, I would kind of try to isolate them one at a time. I go, hey, you know, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, every single one said, yeah, you know, uh, I would. And then I couldn't find a school that would take them. So that kind of forced my hand. And uh, right across the street from the church was our parochial school, uh, elementary school, grades K to 8, which occupied the, uh, the first two floors of a three-story building. The entire third floor was the convent where the ninjas lived, and uh, <laughs> so I gathered all the nuns one evening in the living room, and I sat them down, and I said, hey, you know, would you guys mind, you know, moving out, and, uh, <laughs> and we could turn the convent into a school for gang members, and they kind of looked at each other, and they went, sure, and that was the entirety of their discernment process, and and so that brought gang members in large numbers to the church property, which was created something of a disconnect. You know, parishioners would come up to me and say, hey, you know, aren't parishes supposed to be, you know, hermetically sealed, good people in and bad people out, which was a good gospel challenge. And then uh, the gang members uh, started to say, if only we had jobs. And so myself and the women in the parish, we uh, marched around the factories that surrounded the housing projects, trying to find felony-friendly employers, and that wasn't so forthcoming. So we just started things. You know, we had a maintenance crew, a landscaping crew, a graffiti removal crew, a crew to build our child care center right there on the property, and all made up of rival enemy gang members. And then in 1992, 
after the Rodney King verdict, the whole city of LA e exploded, every pocket of poverty, except the poorest pocket, my parish. And so that led the LA Times to come to me and say, how come that, this place didn't ignite? And I found myself saying, well, uh, you know, I think it's because we had 60 strategically hired rival enemy gang members from the eight gangs, and they were working together side by side. They had a reason to get up in the morning and a reason not to gangbang the night before, and more to the point of your question, a reason not to torch their own community. So the article appeared the next day. Well, the following day, I get a phone call from a movie producer named Ray Stark, who happens to have $500 million. And he summons me to his Beverly Hills office. And he sits me down. And he says, how should I use my money? As I look back on that now, I see how I woefully undershot my request. But <laughs> I was young. And I said, well, there's an abandoned uh, bakery across the street from the school. It's got ovens. They don't work, but we could fix them. You could buy the building. We could put hair nets on rival enemy gang members. They could bake bread. We could call it, I don't know, homeboy bakery. And that was the entirety of my business plan. And he said, sure. So we were off and running, and a month later we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market in downtown LA. Once we had plural, we changed our name from uh, Jobs for a Future to Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this venture, but not everything worked. Uh, I'll be the first to admit it. Homeboy Plumbing really was not hugely successful. <laughs> Who knew uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes? I <clears throat> did not see that coming. And nobody ever intends to do such a thing, but we've backed our way, we've evolved our way into now we're the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program on our planet. We never intended to do that. But now 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors trying to reimagine their lives. Uh, the centerpiece is our 18-month training program. And it's really about healing. I suppose we were job-centric for the first uh, 15 years. But since then, we've been healing-centered, mainly because we discovered that an educated gang member, or returning citizen, or inmate may or may not reoffend and it, uh, an employed one may or may not, but, but a healed gang member won't ever go back to prison, period. And so we set about to do that. Uh, healing will end in the graveyard for all of us, but there's a kind of an essential healing, a fundamental foundational healing that, that we propose to those folks for 18 months. If you surrender to it, it works. It's like attachment repair, you know, Gang members come to us uh, with a, uh, a disorganized attachment. You know, mom was frightening or frightened. And you can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. And so they find rest from their chronic toxic stress, a sanctuary, if you will. And then they become that sanctuary. And then they go home and provide that sanctuary to their kids. And for the first time, you've broken a cycle. And then they leave us after 18 months, having re-identified themselves in the world. And they're resilient in a way they never had been. And now the world will throw at them what it will, but this time they won't be <laughs> toppled by it. And so we have therapy and case management and um, uh, navigators and 50 different kinds of self-help groups from anger management to parenting to grief and loss, lots of 12-step uh, stuff. Uh, we have free ta tattoo removal, no place on the planet Earth removes more tattoos than we do. Uh, we have a designated clinic in our, in our headquarters, which huge headquarters in Chinatown, Los Angeles, and uh, three laser machines, one paid physician assistant, uh, but 43 volunteer doctors. 
So if anybody's starting to regret that council tattoo you have, just uh, <laughs> see, see me afterwards. <clears throat> and it was all started because of a guy named Frank who uh, wandered into my office. I didn't know who he was. He was two days out of Corcoran State Prison, and he was sitting in front of my desk and, and, uh, and tattooed on his forehead like a big old billboard, filling the whole space with big block black letters. It said, fuck the world. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I am having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> And I said, well, Frank, you know, uh, maybe we could put our heads together on this one. And so I, where do I send this guy, you know, to McDonald's? Do you want fries with that? No, I don't want fries. So naturally, I hired him. He, he bagged bread at our bakery for some time. And then I found a doc at White Memorial Hospital who had a laser machine, a dermatologist. And he donated one hour a month to chip away at Frank's forehead and a handful of others. And before no time at all, had a waiting list of 3,000 gang members who wanted the same treatment, so we couldn't really stay with that arrangement. Parentheses, Frank is a security guard at a movie studio in Hollywood, and there is no longer any single trace of the angriest, dumbest thing he had ever done in his life, proving once and for all that every one of us is a whole lot more than the worst things we've ever done. And then along with all those services to help folks heal, we have job trainings, uh, solar panel installation training. We have uh, uh, Homeboy Bakeries Thriving, Homeboy Silkscreen, been around for 27 years. Uh, Homeboy Homegrown Merchandise, where we sell our logo stuff online and in our store. Uh, Homeboy Diner, the only place you can find food at uh, City Hall in Los Angeles. If you fly to American Airlines, the Terminal 4, we have a restaurant there. First one you, you encounter as you uh, go through TSA. We have a thing called Homeboy Grocery, um, where we sell chips, salsas, and guacamole. Um, we're in the stop and shop. Is that in your state? Yeah, yeah so we're there. Uh, in four other states, I think, on the East Coast, and then Walmart in, on the West Coast. Um, as farmers markets, we have a thing, uh, Homeboy Recycling, which is uh, electronic waste. That's proving to be quite a good business. And uh, Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude, will gladly take your order. <laughs> and they cater. Uh, it's kind of a who's who. I promise you, if you go there, you'll run into somebody you know, some celeb, a movie star, or elected official, uh, Jim Carrey, Forrest Whitaker, Jack Black. These are frequent people. Uh, vice President Joe Biden, uh, when he was vice president, two hours notice um, came uh, with Secret Service entourage, selfies with Uncle Joe. Uh, once um, uh, Diane Keaton came, uh, Oscar winner, movie star, Godfather movies, Annie Hall. Uh, her waitress is Glenda, and Glenda's a big girl. Been there, done that, tattooed, felon, parolee, gang member. She had no idea who Diane Keaton was, and so she was taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? And, and uh, Glenda rattled off the three dishes she particularly liked, and uh, and then Diane Keaton said, well, I'll have that second one. That one sounds really good. And it's at that moment, for some reason, something dawns on, on Glenda. She looks at Diane Keaton. She says, wait a minute. I feel like I know you from somewhere. You know, like maybe we've met. And Diane Keaton decides to deflect it humbly. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I suppose I, I have one of those faces that people think they've seen before. And, and then Glenda goes, no, now I know. <laughs> We were locked up together. <laughs> yeah, honest to God, that just took my breath away when I heard it. And uh, I don't think uh, we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings now that I think of it. But 
But suddenly kinship so quickly, Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress, exactly what God had in mind, and if you'll permit me, you hear Jesus say to the gathered that you may be one. It's about us. It's about kinship. It's about obliterating, obliterating once and for all the illusion that we're separate, so we stand against forgetting that. Every one of you is invited to be an enlightened witness, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused attentive love return people to themselves. At Homeboy, we're allergic to the notion of holding the bar up and asking gang members to measure up. Instead, we hold the mirror up and tell people the truth. We say, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. You're here, you're here. And the soul feels its worth, eventually. Because initially, you have to reach in and dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way from gang members knowing the truth of who they are, that they're exactly what God had in mind when God made them. You gotta clear the road The principal suffering of the poor throughout history is shame and disgrace. So it shouldn't surprise us that part of the invitation is to free people from that. In the Acts of the Apostles, they have this very odd line. It kind of leaps out at you, and it says simply this, and awe came upon everyone. And it seems to suggest that the measure of health in any community at all, including this one, may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. So some years ago, I was invited to speak to uh, 600 social workers in Richmond, Virginia. And it's one of those uh, things they call a gang in service. So it's from nine to five in a hotel ballroom. And uh, you know, they have keynotes and workshops and breakout sessions and social workers get credit for this. I've been at a couple of them. So, you know, I figured I'd, you know, do a keynote at lunch or something or close the day. So I said yes and I bought my ticket and then I, I pull out the letter a week before I am to fly and to my horror, I discover that I am to be the only speaker all damn day nine to five. And I said to myself, oh, hell no. <laughs> and so I called two trainees in, uh, Jose and Andre, and I sit them down. And in their 18 months, they're probably like midpoint, like ninth month. And I sit them down and I said, look, at the end of the week, you're flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I'd like you to get up in front of 600 social workers and tell your stories. Take your time. <laughs> Cause we got a long ass day to fill. Well, I'd never heard their stories and Jose gets up first and he's 25 years old, gang member, um, been to prison, tattooed. But like in his ninth month, we have all these different phases and people are moved to this phase and that phase. And he was, had become a very valued member of our substance abuse team. A man solid in his own recovery. Now he's helping younger homies and homegirls with their addiction issues. Uh, you know, so he had a, a long stretch in prison, but he had an even longer stretch as a homeless man and an even longer stretch still as a heroin addict. So he gets up in front of 600 social workers and he says, I, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers audibly gasp. And he says, it sounds way worser in Spanish. He said to them, you know, I've never seen this happen. We, we got whiplash going from gasp to
to laugh. And then he continued. I guess I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California. And she walks up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door. And the guy comes to the door and she says, I found this kid. And she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me. And my grandmother came and rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day, my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day. First t-shirt, because the blood would seep through. Second t-shirt, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they'd make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? Then he stopped speaking, so overwhelmed with emotion. And he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could regain his speech, he said through his tears, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. For the truth of the matter is this, if we don't welcome our own wounds, we may well be tempted to despise the wounded. And so, Let me end with this. I, it occurs sometimes uh, to universities to force their students to read my books against their will. <laughs> and I'm not complaining. But my alma mater, Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington, forced the incoming freshmen to read Tattoos on the Heart. And so they gave me a call and they said, we're going to have a big talk a Tuesday night, huge venue, a thousand people, and they asked me to come, and I said, sure. And uh, they said, could you bring two homies with you? And I always do, you know, if people are gonna pay for it, and, and uh, I always pick homies in the same way, you know? I always pick rivals among our trainees, guys from two enemy gangs, uh, just so that they have to share a hotel room just to mess with them. And I, <laughs> and I always uh, pick homies who have never flown before just for the, you know, the thrill of seeing gang members panicked in the sky. And uh, it was some years ago, I remember I was at LAX with two older vatos and we were flying to DC and, and the guy dead serious says, hey gee, are we flying Virgin Airlines because it's our first time? I said, well, you know, yeah, it's a requirement. You know, uh, we'll be coming home on American. <clears throat> so I picked two homies, uh, uh, 
Bobby, an African-American gang member who worked in the bakery at the time, and uh, Mario, who worked in uh, our merchandise store. Oh my gosh, I've done this probably over a thousand times with men and women. I have never picked anybody so absolutely terrified and panicked of flying than this guy Mario. It was starting in fact, to freak me out. He was, he was hyperventilating, you know, it's like, ah, 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 and, it, and we hadn't even, you know, boarded the plane yet. So, <laughs> so uh, we we're at Burbank Airport and it's a small airport, big bay windows, Southwest Airlines principally, big planes, but they don't have that hermetically sealed chute uh, to board the plane. You have to walk out onto the tarmac like you're the president. And they have the stairs that, steps that lead to the front of the plane and the big feature at Burbank are the steps that lead to the back of the plane. And so I'm sitting there with Mario and Bobby's off exploring the airport and our plane arrives. It's early morning and people are deplaning. And uh, I said, Mario, you know, that's gonna be our plane. And, and, <gasps> And I think, oh my God, he may die before we actually <laughs> climb those stairs. And so then I see our flight crew arrives and the pilot and flight attendants. And, and there are two female flight attendants. Each of them have very large cups of Starbucks coffee. And they're schlepping up the front steps. And, and Mario goes, when are we going to board the plane? And I said, as soon as they sober up the pilots. Uh, <laughs> There, there they go now. <laughs> Perhaps I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but I should tell you that in our 31 year history as an organization, uh, Mario is the most tattooed individual who has ever worked there, which trust me, is saying a lot. He's all sleeved out, covered in tattoos, neck blackened with the name of his gang, head shaved, covered in tattoos, forehead, cheeks, chin, eyelids that say the end so that, you know, when he's lying in his coffin, there will be no doubt for anybody <laughs> viewing him. And, uh, and so I'd never been in public with him. So we're, I'm trying to calm him down. I don't know what to do. So I'm walking him through the airport and people are like this, you know, and mothers are clutching their kids a little more closely. I'm thinking, wow, isn't that interesting? Uh, because if you were to go to Homeboy tomorrow, walk up to anybody who works there and say, quick, who's the kindest, most gentle soul who works here? They won't say me. They'll think for half a second and then they'll say, Mario. Yeah, Mario. Mario works in the cafe now. Mario is proof that only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any shot at changing the world. He's proof of what Jean Vanier, the founder of the L'Arche community movement 60 years ago said, that tenderness is the highest form of spiritual maturity. So we get to Gonzaga and of course there's the big talk on Tuesday night, but what they never tell you is they have 93 other talks planned for you, you know, like this class, this class, this meeting, this lunch, this class, all damn day, I couldn't believe it. And so I tell, you know, Bobby and Mario, I said, look, I'm not speaking at any of these because I'm gonna speak tonight. So I'm gonna sit in the back of the classroom, you guys get up, tell your stories. And they were nervous, especially Mario, terrified. But they did a good job, you know, stories of terror, and torture and violence and abuse of every imaginable kind. And honest to God, if their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance. Otherwise, you'd get scorched. I would not have survived a single day of either of their childhoods. So the nighttime talk comes and as promised, it's packed, thousand people standing room only. I coax them to get out before me to do seven minutes each, kind of a snapshot of their lives. 
so that I, after my talk, I can include them in the question and answer period. They did a good job, though Mario in particular was quite petrified. I get up and do my thing, and then I invite them to stand next to me. And I go, yeah, question, yes, ma'am. And a woman stands and she says, yeah, I got a question. It's for Mario. First question out the gate. And Mario steps up to the microphone, and he's a kind of a tall, skinny drink of water, and he clutches the microphone. He's just terrified. Yes. And she says, well, you say that you're a father, and you have a son, a daughter. They're about to enter their teenage years. What wisdom do you impart to them? You know, what advice do you give them? And Mario closes his eyes and he clutches the microphone and I can sense he's starting to tremble and he's getting a friggin' hernia trying to come up with whatever the hell he's gonna say and when suddenly he blurts out, I just... As soon as he says those two words, he rushes back to his microphone clutching closed-eyed refuge and now I know he's losing the battle with his tears, but he wants to get the whole sentence out. I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence until the woman who asked the question stands and now it's her turn to cry. Why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are loving, you are kind, you are gentle, you are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And a thousand total perfect strangers stand and they will not stop clapping. And all Mario can do is hold his face in his hand, so overwhelmed that this room full of strangers had returned him to himself. And they, in turn, be assured, had been returned to themselves, which shouldn't surprise us, because it's mutual. Everyone standing and seeing each other, everyone saying, you're here, you're here. Everyone's saying, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. And everybody inhabiting the truth and the soul felt its worth. And so you go to the margins to create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. A community of connection where there is no daylight that separates us. You go to the margins and you stand against forgetting that we belong to each other. And you go to the margins to announce something wildly new, a circle of compassion and nobody standing outside of it. And then you cease to care whether anyone accuses you of wasting your time. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. Thank you all very much.